Well, good evening. And welcome to our webinar tonight. Uh, if you can hear me, and if the sound's okay, would you like to give me a thumbs up? Any thumbs up? Can anybody hear me? I can, oh, good. I can see some thumbs. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thank you, Jim. Hello, Martin. Hi. Hi, Martin. I can hear you. Uh, I, I think everybody is unmuted at the moment, Jill. I'm going for it. Hello. Now, hopefully, if all's going according to plan, I should be unmuted again. Yeah? Yep. Yep, that's good. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. And if my eyes keep darting around the screen, it's because I've got a great big plasma in front of me. So if I don't seem to be looking you in the eye, it's apolo I apologize. It's not because I'm naturally shifty, although some people would say that I was. Um, you have to be naturally shifty to be chair of the Institute. So it's, part, it's in the job description. Um, but anyway, welcome to our, our webinar on AED and basic life support, which is what we're going to cover tonight. Now, um, this will come in conjunction with the Institute's AED and BLS um, booklet that uh, you know you can you can apply for if you wish. Um, I've got about 70 slides to get through, so I, I won't, I'll try not to waffle too much over, over e every one. And I think as we will probably go on for about 90 minutes, we'd better have a comfort break halfway through, or certainly somebody of my age should need a comfort break halfway through anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna start by sharing my screen to you. And if you've got any burning questions, then pop them in the chat box. We've got Kirsty and Jill in the background who are looking after the uh, looking after the engineering side of this. So they will pick up the questions if you have any or any comments, and then they'll pass them over to me. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about automated external defibrillators and basic life support. Kirsty has put a chat box right in the middle of my screen. So let me just move that out of the way. It's probably Jill, actually. Jill, was it you that put the chat box in my screen? No, it must be Kirsty then. We'll blame Kirsty. Okay. Right. So action in clinical emergencies. Now, I'm sure many of you, probably virtually all of you, have done or maybe even still have your first aid certificates at the moment. This, this that we're doing is aimed at healthcare professionals in a clinical situation. And so it just concentrates on three things, essentially. It will concentrate on um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. It will concentrate on the treatment of anaphylaxis. And it will also concentrate on using an automated external defibrillator. Um, those three things are possibly the most common things that you will encounter in a clinical situation. And speaking from experience, uh, you will usually encounter them in the most awkward situation that you possibly can. So you will have somebody who's passed out, slumped in a chair, or somebody's trying to roll off the operating table and so on and so forth. It's not like these tidy little things, these tidy little scenarios that you encounter in the average first aid course in the average first aid book where people are lying looking very composed on the floor they're not covered with blood and snot and vomit and all the rest of it um, so you know we're going to talk about it you know perhaps a, a slightly more uh, abrasive um, detail than, than we would if it was a nice tidy clean first aid course um, i can't promise you much blood but we will at least discuss it okay so this is the Institute's um, short course. Um, it's not designed to be a substitute for a full health and, uh, health and safety um, uh, course that you may do that takes you three days to do because it will cover a lot of other things that 
we don't cover in this. For example, we're not going to teach you how to how to tie a sling. We're not going to teach you how to deal with a nosebleed and things like that. These are things that are designed to address the situations that you might commonly commonly encounter. The one thing that you will notice is if you go on to get the book, right, is that the book covers uh, oxygen use as well. Now, um, I don't think that that is a subject that we can really cover in a 90 minute course. It's something that's designed, really does need uh, a longer discussion. So if you have the book, by all means, read through the oxygen side of it. Um, but there is more to oxygen than is in the book. Um, so possibly this is something, if there's enough call for it, we'll probably do another separate one that just covers oxygen therapy, um, you know, at some stage in the future. And if it's something that you want, let head office know and we can always arrange it. Right, well, here we are. This is what we're going to cover. When I can get my act together. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Don't you just hate computers? Right, section one, basic manual life support. Section two, automated external defibrillation, AED. And section three, anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity. So let's start at the beginning. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, good old CPD. You will hear in resuscitation circles a lot talked about the chain of survival. And the chain of survival, I think it was probably um, coined um, by the UK Resuscitation Council. I don't know. I mean, certainly years ago when I was doing my UK Resuscitation Council courses, they always mentioned the chain of survival. And essentially, it is a system of managed care uh, for people who might be in cardiac arrest, who need early access to appropriate treatment, which very often is you. They need early cardiopulmonary resuscitation, in other words, chest compressions. They need early defibrillation, and then they need early advanced care. Early advanced care is obviously when you hand them over to an appropriate professional, such as a paramedic, who I'm sure that you have uh, an equal respect to that that I have for paramedics in that they are wonderful people. And even if we're in a doctor's practice or something like that, we always get the paramedics in. If, the, if we've got a problem, send for a paramedic, wonderful people. Um, and obviously early advanced care can be had in hospitals as well. So that chain of survival is necessary for a good outcome. If you take any links of the chain away, then the chain can fall apart. So for example, you might give them early access to care and that care might be CPR, but you might have, uh, I don't know, some medical condition that prevents you from doing CPR properly. Um, and while you're waiting for somebody to turn up 10 minutes later with a defibrillator, they might have died simply because you've taken that link in the chain away. The same, and I will talk about this at greater length, but if you have early access to care, you're thumping away at the chest like a good one, uh, but there's no defibrillator on site, then you've removed the link, you've removed the chain link of early defibrillation, and once again, you've compromised their chances of survival. And it's the same then if you can't go onto the fourth link of the chain, if you can't get them into appropriate advanced care, then all of the three links, the one, two, three, early access, early CPR, early defib, might come to nothing simply because they wait, you know, five hours to get into a hospital and they die. So all of those links of the chain are very, very important. And here on your screen, you should be able to see um, a blue uh, a blue box that is showing the difference on a heart trace that I'm sure most of you will, will be familiar with of a situation where a cardio, cardiac arrest has, uh, has occurred or a cardiac event. Um, and at the top part, you can see what happens if there's no treatment. So you've got the normal sinus rhythm uh, which is PQRST, like that, going on, tick, 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 tick. That's interrupted by something. The heart rhythm becomes chaotic. It goes into fibrillation. Uh, this uncontrolled quivering, or even no quivering at all, which we call pulseless electrical activity, that we'll talk a bit more about in a short while. 
and then the fibrillation becomes so chaotic that the heart gives up essentially and it turns into a flatliner and once they're flatlined that is a very very bad situation indeed you can then see the next one down delayed defibrillation so once again if it's delayed too much there can be the possibility of care brain brain deterioration and so on and so forth then you've got early cpr and delayed defibrillation slightly a problem as well early access early cpr early defibrillation in the one from the bottom and that's looking fairly good they go back into a sinus rhythm quite well and the same with early access on the bottom early cpr early defibrillation and early advanced care so that's the difference that it makes and you can see the chances of survival uh, down on the right hand side down the column from no chance at all virtually through to a 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent chance which is pretty good it's pretty good um, talking about defibrillation you look at that figure under the zero percent if there's delayed defibrillation then the percentage really does go down so when we're thinking about the chance of survival there's a few thoughts that you can talk about so as we've just seen late diagnosis of cardiac arrest late intervention reduces the chance of survival now we know and certainly those of us who teach first aid uh, prove this on a very regular basis because it's one of the rather naughty things we do sometimes after four minutes of uh, CPR, very often, only 30% of your chest compressions, if you're going to do them, are ineffective. So sometimes if we're being really nasty, we'll get the perhaps the loudest one of a course to do CPR, to do chest compressions for as long as they possibly can. And it's quite unusual for them to go much beyond four or five minutes before they, to, they become terminally exhausted and possibly go into cardiac arrest themselves. But if they're a bit of a nasty person, you don't mind, you can always do that. It's one way of getting rid of the getting rid of the loud ones. Um, it's also true that interruptions in chest compressions are associated with a reduced chance of survival. So if you have to stop your chest compressions that you're giving for any reason to deal with something, to maybe to find a helper, even perhaps to run for a defib unit itself, then that reduces the chance of survival. Uh, ineffective chest recoil reduces the chance of survival and that's when you actually compress the chest and you don't let it return away from the compression appropriately and also and this is a bit of a probably a, a bit of a contentious subject at the moment lengthy ventilations reduce the chance of survival now i'm sure that many of you will have seen adverts on the television a few years ago where you had that um, i think he was a boxer uh, and his name escapes me at the moment where he said you only you only swap spit with your wife or something like that so he was trying to get the idea over that um chest compressions are the most important thing you can do and it might not be very important to do ventilations mouth to mouth ventilation in other words um and yes he's got a point um because clamping your mouth over somebody else's mouth especially when they're in danger of vomiting down your throat uh, or they might have all sorts of nasty diseases, perhaps isn't a particularly good idea at the moment in time. But there are alternatives to that. Bottom line is, uh, if you don't want to clamp your mouth over their mouth and run the risk of getting a, a mouthful of puke, then nobody would blame you for being unwilling to do that. But if you are willing or able, perhaps in some other way, to give them ventilation, statistically, it does help it does help a little bit but if you don't do it and you can't do it or you won't do it then that's your choice that's your choice okay what happens if a heart goes into cardiac arrest well quite a lot actually the geometry of the heart itself alters so the right side of the heart becomes larger the septum that's the dividing tissue between the various chambers of the heart becomes distorted the left side of the heart becomes constrained there's an increase in the pressure around the pericardium, the pericardial pressure, um, so that if it's been delayed too long, even if you defibrillate, there might not be uh, an effective defibrillation. 
because bear in mind the word defibrillation literally means to stop the heart fibrillating, to stop this uncontrolled, sometimes almost unnoticeable quivering that is not an effective heart rhythm that will not pump blood around the body. And you also get a movement of arterial blood to the venous side of the circulation, which is essentially deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood. So um, after five minutes of cardiac arrest, you can understand why a lot of people, you know, won't come back from that dark place. So what can you do to help? Well, the first thing you can do to help and the most important thing possibly, once you've actually established that they need chest compressions, is to give early chest compressions. And as you can see there, um, our, little, our little figure there has their hands interlinked. They have their arms straight, and this is very, very important. And they have positioned those interlinked, interlinked hands on the, the meeting point of the front of the ribs, that little grisly bit that you can feel where the ribs meet called the ziffy sternum, which is the bottom of the sternum bone. And it's a little grisly bit that hangs there. And that's where you need to put your hands. And that's where you need to put your weight. Because if you are going to compress the chest, and bear in mind, you need to compress it, you know, by, by a fair depth, by a fair depth. Then if you are going to compress it, you need to have your arms straight. Don't try and do it with bent arms. It's absolutely exhausting if you do that. And it's not as effective as compressing it with the weight of your upper body behind it. That's the most effective and the most efficient way to do it. Now, how do you essentially arrive at the decision that somebody is in cardiac arrest. Well, if they are unconscious and if they are not breathing normally, then it is likely to be cardiac arrest. So you have to check for breathing and you also have to check that they're unconscious because they might just be having a kip. Um, back in the old days, in the bad old days, some would say, when we were taught our first aid, we were told to grasp them firmly by their earlobe and grind our nails into their earlobe whilst pulling on the ear. And if they were just having a sleep, if they were having a quiet kip, then that would usually bring them round. Or if they were just drunk out of their mind, then they might stir a bit. And of course, if they do that, you're OK. In today's politically correct time, I certainly cannot recommend in any shape or form that you abuse people's earlobes. Uh, and certainly if, you know, if it became known that I had suggested that, then possibly the Health and Care Professions Council would take a, a greater interest in me and want to talk to me about spreading gloom and disaffection and incorrect things throughout the profession of podiatry and foot health. So how do you find out whether they're actually not responsive? Well, basically, you use your voice, so you talk to them quite loudly. Um, you try and establish where you think their eye contact might be. And if possible, you grasp the shoulders and you gently move the shoulders, bearing in mind that if they've got something like a severe neck injury, that might not be a good idea, but your, your options are limited. And also, you listen for breathing. So if you place your ear above their nose and you look down the body, and you watch for the rise and fall of the chest. And if you listen for the whistle of air coming out of their breathing orifices, if they're breathing, fine. They're not in cardiac arrest, so you don't need to go into the chest thumping bit. But if they're unconscious, but still breathing, then you would put them into the recovery position, which we'll talk about in a little more detail later on. The only thing that can confuse the matter is what we call agonal gasps. Um, any of you who have been present at end of life may well have heard agonal gas gasps. Um, they have in the past been called things like the death rattle. Basically, it's the body just ticking over and it's not breathing at all and the heart has stopped. So it's the nervous system actually going into a kind of spasm. Um, once you've heard them, you'll never forget them. They're a strange strangled um, strange strangled sound, uh, but an agonal gasp is not breathing. 
So, how do you do this? <laughs> right, there we go. Try again. You need to do things in a sequence. And the first uh, part of any sequence, when you're going to do any kind of first aid intervention, is have a safe approach. Now, obviously, if you're in a clinical situation, they'll probably be in a safe situation anyway. But, you know, you won't have to cope with, with traffic or spraying petrol or fires or things like that. But nonetheless, ensure that the approach is safe. Check for a response. Shout for help. And this is very important. Open their airway. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Check their breathing. Call 999. And if they are not breathing, give 30 chest compressions. And if you are willing and able to do it, two rescue breaths. Um, the shouting for help, help bit is very important because, as I say, you can probably only continue to do resuscitation yourself, single-handed, for a matter of a few minutes. And that few minutes might not be enough. So if you can get somebody there as an assistant, perhaps to give you a little bit of a break if you're doing chest compressions, or perhaps to call 999, or perhaps to run and get a defibrillator unit if there's one locally, then fine. It's always useful to have somebody with you. And this is a, an opportunity for you to overcome your traditional British reserve. Um, do shout for help. If necessary, very loudly. If necessary, very, very aggressively. Uh, if necessary, getting eye contact with some poor unsuspecting passerby or somebody else in your clinic and making sure that they do do what you want them to do, which is to, if necessary, call 999, and if necessary, get a defibrillator unit and so on and so forth. But if you go into it single-handed and there's no chance of getting any assistance at all, then number six um, essentially, takes precedence over everything. You need to call 999. Even if you have to stop doing what you're doing, call 999. We'll talk about that a little more as well later. So, safety, safety at the scene, safety of rescues, safety of the victim, safety of bystanders. Uh, checking the response. So gently shake the shoulders, gently check, look, Use all of the things that you have just been told there. If the patient responds, leave them where they are, try and find out what is wrong, and then reassess them regularly because they might be okay this minute, but they might then go into cardiac arrest the next minute. Shout for help, and as I say, try and overcome your natural reserve. Open their airway, and you open the airway by gently tilting the head back with your hand under the chin as well and put it back like that and hold it back like that while you're checking for the breathing. I mean, you can see how effective that is if you put your own head down on your chest and try and take a deep breath, it's very hard. If you put your head right up like that, open the airway here, take a deep breath, it's much, much easier. So you need to ensure that that airway is open before you actually check them for breathing. And when you're checking for breathing, Check for 10 seconds, no more, no more than 10 seconds. If no help arrives immediately, and as I say, use a phone, shout, wave, shout louder, if necessary, scream. Uh, another thing as well, when you're talking about summoning help, now, if you're in a surgery or if you're in a clinical situation, fine, you should be able to describe where you are. But if you can't describe where you are, then there is a possibility in many areas, if you're using an Android phone and also the equivalent in a, an iPhone, then there is a way of the emergency services tracking down to pretty close to the area that you're in. It's still not clear, certainly from the information I've got, that this is available everywhere. So I'm not certain that it is. So personally, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that, especially if you're in an area that you don't know um, but you might like to consider these. What three words? You may have come across it. What three words? The entire country, possibly the entire world, for all I know, 
is divided into those small squares. And each small square, this is proprietary software, but it's free of charge to use. Um, every one of those skets, squares has three words associated with it. So for example, that square that we're looking at there, which is somewhere in Hertfordshire, where that fire engine is just immediately in front of the fire engine, it is called rocky.limit.crisp. Sorry, that's Leeds, not Hertfordshire, this one. Rocky.limit.crisp. And if you give those three words to the person on the other end of the 999 call, and assuming that they've got three, what three words, and you can look it up for yourself on that web address underneath, then they can identify you to an area that's no bigger than that square. Jolly useful, perhaps, if you're in the middle of the country. Maybe if that's where you do your healthcare, I don't know. But it can be useful everywhere. So it might be something that's worthwhile you having a look at. So we've opened the airway. And there we are. We've tilted the head back gently. We're supporting the chin as well. Looking for any obstructions that you can see in the mouth. You may wish to clear the mouth yourself just to check that there isn't an obstruction that you can easily remove. Equally, you may not want to put your fingers in the mouth of somebody who might then promptly bite it off. So as with everything, have a care. But open the airway, check the breathing for no more than 10 minutes, 10 seconds, not 10 minutes, sorry. And you can see that she's checking it there. So she's listening, she's looking along the chest, looking for the rise and fall. If there is rise and fall, then fine. If they're still unresponsive, put them in the recovery position. If they're not breathing, then you need to go into your chest compressions. And as I said before, don't confuse agonal breathing with normal breathing. If you actually want to listen to agonal breathing, um, if you go and do a YouTube search, you'll find that there's several instances recorded on YouTube of people in agonal breathing. There's one, for example, on Bondi Beach in Australia uh, of a resuscitation uh, situation where a guy is pulled out of the surf and the only thing he's doing at that time is agonal breathing. Point of fact, they gave him CPR, they gave him defib, um, and he did come around uh, at the end of that. So, chest compressions. You start off with 30 chest compressions in an adult, in a normal situation. And then if you're willing, ready and able to do so, you give two rescue breaths. A rescue breath obviously means that you, in some fashion, seal your mouth to their mouth, you block their nose, and you give a short, sharp breath into their lungs. You give two of those, you look for a rise and fall to ensure that there's air going in and air coming out, but you don't delay too much between those breaths. There are um, alternatives to this, and we will look at those. And those are alternatives. On the top left-hand side, you've got what we call a pocket mask. Um, if any of you are scuba divers, you'll recognize this. This is what you actually carry on your rescue diver course. Um, but you have to use these while you're actually towing somebody backwards in the water, which is great fun. I can assure you, having been both the casualty and the person doing the, doing the demonstration, uh, it's pretty hard to do, much easier to do on dry land. Um, but they're quite a handy thing. You can carry them in a case, you can carry them in a pocket and so on, a soap pocket, and you stretch them out. You see all that mask section over their mouth and their nose. You hold it in place and you blow in through that tube. Now, those will have a valve in as well. So that valve, if they are going to be sick, if they are going to try and projectile vomit into your mouth, it won't actually get in there. The mask will stop it. Um, there is another alternative at the bottom, and at the bottom, uh, that is a bag valve mask resuscitator. And as you can see, there's a flexible bag um, made of plastic with a handle on top of it, then there's a plastic bag at the end of it. You can see that I'm just holding um, a tube, which would be an oxygen tube from an oxygen supply that can actually fit onto a little port in there. And on the other end of it, you have a similar sort of mask to the one that you've got on the pocket mask at the top, 
that you can actually seal over their nose, over their mouth, and ensuring their airway is open, you can use that to inflate their lungs. Um, the problem can be, of course, that you actually have to ensure that the airway is open at the same time while you're doing that, because if the airway has fallen forward and blocked, then your bag valve mass resuscitation won't be very effective at all. This is where something like those little hooky devices on the right hand side can be useful. Those are called Goodell airways. And essentially, you place those into the mouth sideways. You get one that's an appropriate size. As you can see, we've got everything going from babies up to large adults running up the screen. And it's best to be shown the technique of inserting these. But once you've actually inserted them, it will keep the airway open. And you can use something like a BVM, like a bag valve mask, or any other type of uh, you know, resuscitation mask, like a pocket mask, much, much easier without the danger of the airway falling back and blocking itself. Um, these and another type of airway device called a laryngeal mask, which is uh, or a T-gel, some of them are called, which actually fits over the back of the mouth and is a, is a flexible jelly-like substance or it's made of silicone. These are the only two types of airways that you would use if you were not a consultant anaesthetist in a resuscitation situation in the hospital. Um, the old uh, blade types of airways where you have to uh, use a large metal construction that you get to go down the back of the throat, they are not recommended for the kind of resuscitation that we would be doing. And even in a hospital situation, when you're part of a crash team, um, certainly the ones that I've worked in, the only people who are allowed to put a, a blade um, airway in is, is a consultant anaesthetist because uh, it's very, very easy to very severely damage or even kill the person that you're actually trying to uh, ventilate. But things like this are relatively safe, as you can imagine. It's a good L airway, G-U-E-D-E-L, I think, um, is how they spell it. And uh, it's something you can actually look up on YouTube. And I haven't looked myself, but I'd imagine there's probably a lot of uh, information on YouTube showing you how to put these in. They're very cheap to buy, very cheap to use. Um, obviously, they're single use. They would be you know, sterile in a bag. Then you can just use them and then chuck them away. But they're quite a handy thing to look for. An easy thing to keep in your resuscitation kit, as is a bag valve mask respirator like that. One thing with those respirators, the recommended um, usage rate in an adult is about eight compressions a minute. And this is an adult sized uh, bag. You can get pediatric ones that are obviously smaller. But if you if you really do it without waiting between the bag compressions, and you do it more than eight times a minute, then you can actually end up with a situation where you start to force air down into the stomach and you will stimulate projectile vomiting, which is not a good thing to do uh, because once they start vomiting and once they start breathing that vomit in, unless you're very lucky or in the right resuscitation situation, then they're dead. So you've killed them. So don't do it more than eight times a minute. And of course, the advantage is with devices like that, um, you can have two people working on the same person at the same time. So you can have somebody doing chest compressions, you can have somebody doing the respiration, and then you can switch over after a couple of minutes, which is jolly useful. And if you do connect these to an oxygen supply, then that plastic bag on the end will inflate with oxygen. And then when you next compress and open that uh, big plastic reservoir, it will suck in oxygen from that bag reservoir, so you'll be delivering a strongly oxygenated uh, concentration of air into their lungs. But uh, worth looking at, they're quite cheap as well. You would probably buy single use ones of those for about a tenner, uh, and they'll be sealed up and you can keep them for a couple of years until hopefully you never need to use them. Right, so we've already spoken about that, but the basic protocol is you open the airway, you pinch the nose, you take a breath if you're willing to do it mouth to mouth. You make a seal with your mouth if you're willing to do it. You breathe into their mouth, you inflate for one second, you release, you allow the chest to fall, and then you repeat. And you keep repeating that whilst you can, 30 to 2, 30 to 2, 30 to 2. And anything longer than a one second 
one or two seconds in reality, you will reduce their chance of survival. Um, if the breasts don't seem to be going in, then check the mouth. If there is a visible obstruction and you're willing to remove it and hazard your fingers, then do so. Check that the head tilt and the chin lift is correct. Check that the nose is pinched. Don't attempt more than two breaths each time before returning to chest compressions because there might obviously be something preventing those breaths from going in. But at least chest compressions um, are the best of a bad scenario. So if you are unwilling or not unable to give rescue breaths, then give continuous uninterrupted chest compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute and a depth of two inches or so, so four to five centimeters in an adult. If it's a child, by the way, uh, a young child I'm talking about, then a third of the depth of their chest. If they're over eight or nine, then you treat them as an adult. So 100 to 120 per minute. Um, a good idea of that timing is to sing the song Nelly the Elephant packed her trunk and said goodbye to the circus to yourself while you're doing it. That gives you a pretty good rhythm for it. Um, I won't attempt to sing that because that's had very unfortunate events associated with it later uh, in, in the previous times. Uh, you, believe me, you don't want to hear me sing. It's not a good thing. So usually when we're in a when we're in a face to face scenario, I normally suggest that we as a group do a bit of harmony of Nelly the Elephant. Although some of the younger people do uh, tend to use staying alive, staying alive, which they claim is better, but I don't know the words to that. So we stick to Nella the Elephant if it's one of my classes. So there we are, 30 to 2, 30 to 2, 30 to 2. Now, if there's more than one rescuer, obviously change position if you can. So there's the adult basic life support sequence summary. If they're unresponsive, shout for help. Open the airway, check whether they're breathing. If they're not breathing normally, call 999, which you know, I would have been prepared to do earlier because if they're unresponsive, then you still need to call 999 even if they're breathing. Give 30 chest compressions if they're not breathing and then continue the protocol of two rescue breaths and 30 chest compressions, however you want to do it. So if you have any questions, if you'd like to put them in the chat box and either Jill or Kirsty will highlight um, any things that we need to talk about. And yeah, Rachel, thank you, Rachel. Um, she points out quite rightly that you can download the what three word app and you can get that on your phone because you can then use that yourself. You know, if you need to explain to the AA or the RAC where you are, if you download it on your phone, it is free to use. Uh, I think commercial organizations who use it pay a license fee, uh, but you as an end user, it's free to use and it can be, it can be jolly useful. Um, some of, the, uh, uh, some of the, the words that they use are sometimes perhaps inappropriate. You know, you might, uh, it might be on a, a burial ground or something and it might say you know dead again dead dot again something something there's nothing personal in it it's simply selected at random by computer um, but it has been pointed out that there are a few occasions where it does seem to be inappropriate or insensitive at any rate okay i'm not seeing any questions come through so we seem to be happy with that right so let's go on to a automated external defibrillation. Now, <clears throat> sudden cardiac arrest is invariably the leading cause of death. Certainly in Europe, it affects 700,000 plus people in a year. Um, many, individ many individuals could survive if bystanders had immediately assisted by arranging early access to professional care, early CPR. Uh, and early defibrillation if possible. It's worth making the point that some people say, well, if you've got a defibrillator, you don't need CPR. You don't need chest compressions. In point of fact, you usually do because when a heart um, becomes dysfunctional, 
when it stops having that normal sinus rhythm, then the chances of putting it back into a sinus rhythm by chest compressions uh, is very small. This is where you need a machine or some method of stopping those fibrillations. <coughs> and that's where the defibrillator comes in. Um, and it's worth also making the point that a defibrillator will not start a dead heart. If there's nothing going on in the heart, if there is no fibrillation taking place, or if there is no even pulseless electrical activity, PEA, which means that there's still something going on in the wiring of the heart, even though it's not a true uh, fibrillation, then that's the defibrillator doesn't have anything to work on if it doesn't have any, either of those things to go. It cannot defibrillate something that doesn't have fibrillation. It won't just start the heart again. Um, and I've just seen something come up from Sharon, by the way. Is it right that you have to break ribs doing compressions to be doing it properly? No. It's a short answer to that. No, it isn't. Um, you may break a rib, but um, if you do, it's certainly something you shouldn't aim for. I mean, if you really want to break somebody's ribs, hit them with a sledgehammer uh, if you don't like them to that extent. But uh, you certainly shouldn't set out with the aim of breaking somebody's ribs. No, not to be recommended. So I think we've made the point that chest compressions by themselves um, are unlikely to work. Um, defibrillation by itself on a heart that has no activity in it is highly unlikely to work. The two need to go in sequence because what you can do, if a heart is not giving any output at all, your compressions can start a small amount of activity going, even if it is this pulseless electrical activity that I've talked about. But you give, you give the defibrillator something to work with. You give it something to work with. And that's very important. You need to give it that start. Um, we've already covered that to a certain extent, uh, but I'll just run through it in the cause of completeness. That's the normal heart rhythm, a uh, sinus rhythm. And when the heart starts to tremble out of control, that is ventricular fibrillation. As you know, I'm sure all of you, the heart has the atria, which are the top chambers. It has the ventricles, which are the bottom chambers. And the atriums, they allow the blood to go into the bottom chambers, but it's the actual bottom chambers, the ventricles, that do the muscular contractions that pump the blood around. And those are the things that you want to get back into a proper rhythm. So what does defibrillation do? What is it? Well, it's an electrical charge that goes through the heart. For example, here's one I prepared earlier. And I'll just change my camera over. There we go. That's a training defibrillator that you should be seeing now at the moment. And as you can see, it has pads which have a handy uh, guide on as to where you should put them. And one of the pads is put on the top of the right hand area just below the clavicle. The other one is put on the So that's showing that there. And the other one, it's not, I'm sorry, I showed you the, I showed you the wrong one. <laughs> Let's try again. Right, they'll say this guy doesn't know where his clavicle is. So there you go. So that's showing just below the top right hand clavicle. And the other one is showing just on the side of the chest just by the fifth intercostal space, just on the side of the ribs there. And the idea is that that will allow an electrical current to pass through the chambers of the heart and galvanize them into action. And that's where one of these things comes in. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. Plug in pads connector next to flashing light. Apply pads. 
plug-in connector. Right, it'll keep doing that ad infinitum until I plug some pads in and apply a connector. So I won't do that. Um, but as you can see there on your screen, that's another type of uh, training AED. You'll come across many different types now. Um, some of them have a little uh, telltale screen like that one has that will actually show you a heart rhythm. Certainly the ones that we use in hospital usually have a bigger version of that. Uh, certainly the ones in hospital, you can actually change the output. But on the kind that you will encounter um, in the community, then they'll usually preset for an outlet for, for an output. Um, but this little computer control device, once you've connected a person up to it, will be able to analyze a rhythm or lack of it of the heart. And it will be able to talk to you and tell you whether you need to deliver a shock or not. Most um, defibrillators that you will encounter are shock advisory defibrillators, which means it will tell you when it's charging. It will tell you to stand clear from the patient and it will tell you when it advises a shock and it will tell you to deliver the shock. So they really are as simple as that. And if you've never had the chance to have a look at one, it's a good idea if you possibly can. But once again, through the beauty of YouTube, um, you'll find that there's any number of, uh, any number of examples of those, uh, you know, showing you the various different types and so on and so forth. Um, now, Brenda Griffin, thank you, Brenda. You can download the AED Locations app on your phone so that you always know there is one nearby if you need one. Very good and perfectly true, you can do. Um, but more and more places have these. I mean, there's a little village um, that we go on holiday to in the normal course of events up in, up in the Spanish mountains. It's absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it does have, however, a helipad and it's got uh, two AEDs on uh, properties, on the walls of properties, when you walk around this tiny, tiny village. Um, so you will encounter these things in many, many places. Um, a lot of them in this country, certainly you'll see in a locked cabinet that usually has a keypad to it. If you for, call 999, tell them where you are, give them some details, they will actually give you a code to open it. And then when you open it, you take the thing out, you just follow the directions on it, and they are that simple. They really are that simple. And they are essential. If you can get one, it's far, far better than just you know carrying on regardless. That's it in close-up. But once again, this is just an example of it. It's certainly not the only kind that you will encounter. Any of you who've been to our head office clinic up in Southport, you'll see that we've got one there. And we always, um, we always run through that with the students that we've got there showing you that. And they're relatively cheap to buy now as well. One time they used to cost thousands. Now you can probably get them from about 750 pounds upwards. Uh, you can also get some on, um, on leasing. Let me just change these cameras back so that you're not just looking at that. Well, there's probably a better viewpoint than looking at me. There we go. Here it is. Here's a horrible face back again. Um, so yeah, you can also lease the things as well. And they'll have lease plans and service plans and so on and so forth. And uh, it may well be that it's something to consider for your own for your own location, if there isn't one there already. There are also charities you can approach to put those in place as well. So it's a, it's a subject that's worth, worth exploring. The diagram on your, the diagram on your um, screen does show you the importance of the correct electrode positioning because if you put the electrodes too close together then you'll just have a very superficial current flow and it won't actually go through the chambers that it needs to go through. Um, you do need to have it as I say one just below the right hand clavicle area and the other one on the left hand uh, side of the chest in the by the fifth intercostal area. Um, that will give you an effective current. If, by the way, something prevents you from 
that kind of pad placement in the worst case scenario you put one pad on the front of them one pad on the back of them it's not as effective but sometimes for example if someone has had bits of the body blown away or their physician won't let you get to it then front and back is better than nothing and equally of course if you're defibrillating a very small child and you can get pediatric defib pads you still use the same defibrillator then a front to back pad placement would be the correct way to do it simply because the pads would be too close together otherwise if you were trying to go for the for the adult positioning um, what would happen if you had an incorrect electro placement example etc cetera, etc cetera? Um, well um, if you did it wouldn't work simple as that it wouldn't work uh, or it might might work imperfectly um, there's no other answer to that if it's not in the right place it won't work um, here's a reading from a data card of a successful defibrillation and we can go through that at sequence so there we go there's a chaotic heart trace at the top the pads are on at uh, 1235 and 12 seconds a shock is advised by the machine at 1235 and 18 seconds the machine is charging uh, at 1235 and 29 seconds a shock is delivered at 1235 and 30 seconds and following that, no shock is advised. So if no shock is advised, you continue CPR, you continue the chest compressions. Because either it might mean that there is nothing that the um, defibrillator can detect, or there's some other reason it wants you to continue those compressions. And there we go. As you can see, it has re-established a heart rhythm here. And there is a better than nothing heart rhythm on the bottom it's still rather chaotic you still haven't got the perfect pqrst but nonetheless you've got a lot better rhythm there than you have with that chaotic jumble on the top and there on the bottom this quite remarkably the ambulance arrived at 12:38, and the pads were taken off at 12:39. Um, so that's obviously an, an ideal case scenario uh, a very very quick ambulance was obviously waiting on the front drive but it's worth saying as well, once you have done the defibrillation, um, leave the pads on because you might need to do it again. Uh, and also, uh, you may, if you have any doubts about the person, want to put the pads on as a precaution anyway. So there we are. That is a perfect successful defibrillation. In the real world, it usually won't be quite as successful as or quite as short as that. But... Um, Depending on the brand of machine that you've got, some switch on automatically when you open them, uh, some don't, some you have to switch them on manually. Um, usually the machines are a shock advisory machine, which once you've got them actually connected up, will then tell you when a shock is advised and when to deliver it. There are a few that are completely automatic. The only problem with that is that it doesn't really give you that much of a chance to get out of the way. And of course, ideally, you don't want to be touching that person when they're being shocked. And also, when the machine is analysing them, you don't want to be giving them chest compressions either. So you do. If the machine says analysing, it will say analysing, do not touch the patient. Because obviously, it will give a false report to the machine. But you need to start those chest compressions as soon as you possibly can after that. So once it says charging, for example, you can go back to giving chest compressions because some machines can take up to 30 seconds to charge, depending on the type they are. And that's another 30 seconds of chest compressions you could probably possibly get in. So that's the automatic external defibrillation sequence. Safe approach, as always, uh, which can be sometimes hard if they're slumped in your treatment chair. Um, check for a response, shout for help, open the airway, check the breathing. If they're not breathing, call 999 attach an automated external defibrillator and follow the voice prompts. And then if it brings a rhythm back and they start to breathe, put them in the recovery position, it will be unlikely that they'll sit up and say, oh, thank you very much, I feel much better. Um, although sometimes if they have been fitted with an internal defibrillator, um, 
that they they sometimes have you you can actually see that if somebody goes into a into a a situation where the defibrillator internally needs to kick in then they can remain conscious but usually if it's the kind of resuscitation that we're talking about here they won't sit up and say well thanks very much that's fine they will still need all the follow-ups and they could of course go into a rest again um, it's a good idea and it's very hard to do it when we're just talking on the computer but it's a good idea perhaps to practice a scenario in your own clinics or your own treatment rooms of what would happen if somebody has a heart attack sitting in your chair or if somebody slumps off the chair and has a heart attack especially if they're uh, you know, a 25 stone patient how do you deal with it it's a good idea to do that as part of the normal risk analysis that all of us do as healthcare professionals anyway um, I mean, it's, it's not only that, it's even the, how do you deal with a simple faint, you know, because a simple syncope um, where a person becomes you know, unresponsive, although they're not going into a resuscitation situation, uh, nonetheless, they can still tumble off the, uh, the chair and hurt themselves. Um, and I know, I mean, I saw that myself uh, last week. I was doing some vaccinations in our local vaccination centre that I've been working at from time to time. And this person who... Uh, when I asked him when I was doing his assessment, you know, pre the injection, I said, you know, are you okay with needles? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. 25 stone individual. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm fine, thank you, fine. As soon as I delivered uh, a dose of Oxford's best into him, turned, uh, turned a strange shade of white and uh, slumped down in the chair. Now, of course, bear in mind, this is just sitting in a normal stacking plastic chair. So that was quite an interesting scenario. Um, how to stop him rolling off the chair and beating himself to death, or uh, how to deal with it uh, with just little old me uh, and a very, very, very small nurse and a very, uh, very small computer operator in our treatment pod as well. Um, so that actually brought it home to me that, well, no, I haven't, uh, I haven't assessed this scenario before. So uh, when I'm there again tomorrow and Friday this week, uh, I'll make sure that I assess that scenario. <laughs> if I have another 25 st stone person who claims to be fine with needles, but actually really isn't, then uh, I'll have things positioned appropriately, including a treatment chair that we can slide him into. So it's always a good idea to do those little thought experiments, um, you know, of what would happen if something happens in your particular uh, particular treatment location. So there's the protocol. Attach the AED pads. Uh, you do have to naturally expose the chest sufficiently. If they are of the opposite sex, you need to bear in mind appropriate actions, especially in this day and age. If they are a, an individual, and I, I used to say if they're a lady wearing a brassiere that has got underwiring, then you should, if possible, move it to one side if it's in the way so that you don't burn them. But I think in today's world, I cannot assume it would necessarily be a lady. So I'll rather say if it's an individual wearing an underwire or underwired brassier, then move it out of the way if it appears to be a danger and then attach the pads. And if this person, be they male or female, has a particularly hairy chest, then do you shave the chest or not? Don't let the shaving of a chest interfere too much with what you're doing. Um, a lot of defibrillator kits will have a razor in them, you know, one of these disposable razors you can just rub over a hairy bit. So you may wish to do a little bit of shaving, um, but don't let it be your be all and end all. The most important thing is to get those pads on appropriately. And minimal delay, minimal delay, minimal delay. And if possible, continue the chest compressions. So somebody else could be doing the chest compressions while you're working around them, attaching the AED pads. And then just follow the voice prints. Make sure that nobody touches the patient whilst the shock is being delivered. Um, and also perhaps if they're lying on a trolley with a metal framework, just have a care that maybe that one of their arms isn't dangling down and creating a circuit with the metal framework and you're not leaning against the metal framework, uh, which can be a rather shocking experience. Uh, it won't kill you, but it certainly will concentrate your mind. And once you've delivered the shock, immediately resume CPR for two minutes, follow the voice prompts, 
and then just repeat, 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 until hopefully some of our wonderful paramedics turn up and deal with the situation, uh, which you can pass it over with a, a, sigh of, a sigh of relief, believe me. Okay. If no shock is indicated, once again, follow the prompts. Uh, carry on with the CPR because it might be trying to get you to restore some kind of activity to that heart that a defibrillator can deal with. Because if it's a completely dead flatlined heart, unless you rip open the chest, stick a pair of chest expanders in there and start massaging the heart, which probably we wouldn't do in a podiatry situation. Apart from that, we haven't got big enough uh, bone shears usually. Then uh, unless you do that, you will not start a completely dead heart. So that's where the chest compressions, that's where the heart compressions come in, doing them manually. And you carry on until qualified help arrives or they start to breathe normally, or you become too exhausted to continue. And believe me, if you do this for four, five, six minutes, it really does become exhausting. If it's not exhausting, you're not doing it properly, essentially. But as I said at the beginning, a good tip is to ensure that your hands are, your arms are straight, your hands are interlinked, and you use the weight of your upper body to help you compress that chest. Then if they start to breathe normally, leave the pads attached, put them in the recovery position, and then monitor them. If the person happens to be pregnant, don't leave them lying on this side for more than 20 minutes without turning them over. And there's the recovery position. Um, it's something, once again, online, we can't really practice it. But if you do get a chance to practice it, it can be quite useful. You know, get somebody to lie on the floor. Um, you should be trying to roll them over towards yourself because then that way you can control the, you can control the, the, the amount that they roll over, the amount that they move. So you draw the leg up the opposing leg to the opposite side that you are. You draw up the opposing arm and you place the back of the hand at the side of their face, taking care that there isn't a great big chunky ring on it. Ideally, you ensure that there's no sharp objects in their pocket. If there are a lot of things in their pocket and if you want to remove them, have a care. You don't want them to allege that you've stolen you know, 100,000 pounds worth of jewels from their pocket. So just think safety there, put them somewhere safe and hopefully have a witness to do that if you have to remove that. If not, then you carry on regardless. So drawing up that leg, holding the back of that hand against their cheek that is closest to you, you then roll them over towards you so that their head rests on that hand. You pull the head back slightly to ensure that the airway is open you pull the leg that you have pulled towards you over at that 90 degree angle and you put them in a position, a tidy position like that, so they won't roll any further, but with a head to the side and the airway open so that if they do vomit, hopefully the vomit will run out of their mouth and they won't inhale it because inhaling vomit is quite a common cause of death because once your lungs are full of puke, doesn't matter whether you put them on oxygen or anything else. Uh, okay, if you've got a suction machine there, handy in your pocket, it might help. But if their lungs are really contaminated with vomit, then no, there's not a huge amount you can do. Um, and it's worthwhile, as I say, practicing that recovery position a little bit with a willing, a willing helper. And a good mnemonic to remember how to do it is, please, sir, so you put the hand up, lift my leg, and roll me over, quite simple. Please, sir, put the hand up, slap the face, lift the leg and roll them over. So there's the mnemonic for it. Any questions? There's our summary. Now, you will be getting copies of this presentation so you can go through it at your, uh, at your leisure. Now, we've been on now for just over an hour, or approaching just over, just over an hour. Uh, shall we take a, just a five minute comfort break for anybody who wants it? The 
it's caused me topping my tea up as well. Um, I hope that you have uh, taken your comfort break and you're back with us. We're on the homeward, uh, we're on the homeward run now, folks. Um, right, okay. Now let's launch into anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity, which uh, is something that it's quite possible you will encounter, and especially if you use a lot of local anaesthetics. Uh, although I do think that um, its frequency in local anaesthetic uh, usage is now uh, rather exaggerated. Certainly back in the day when some of the local anaesthetics that we used to use um, were um, based on esters, um, they were, they had a much greater potential to cause hypersensitivity and anaphylaxis. Um, nowadays, that we, we tend to use more modern local anaesthetics. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's rare, it's, it's rare to encounter it uh, if you're using your local anaesthetic correctly and if you're not pumping the veins and their arteries full of it, which of course none of us would do, naturally. So, Let's look at anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity. What is it? Well, there's a definition of it. There are others. A severe, sometimes fatal allergic reaction, a hypersensitivity, which is characterized by a sharp drop in blood pressure, by skin, uh, skin eruptions, urticaria, otherwise known as hives, breathing difficulties that are caused by exposure to a foreign substance, such as a drug or a bee string, bee sting or some other kind of sensitizing exposure, a rubber glove, um, some other substance that you put on their skin. Uh, the reaction, of course, may be fatal because the underlying problem is the catastrophic drop in blood pressure, which starves the essential organs of blood oxygen. And that's something that does need to be treated. I mean, obviously, it's simplest. You can treat it uh, somebody's conveniently lying on their back, uh, you could treat it by elevating the legs, which you would normally do if they were in syncope and a faint. Uh, but very often that's not enough. So that's when you have to administer something uh, that will cause venous constriction and therefore put their, uh, put their blood pressure up. And the commonest thing that, uh, or the recommended thing that you will administer would be adrenaline or epinephrine to give it its uh, chemical name uh, because adrenaline is actually a trademark. It was trademarked a number of years ago. And although we do call it adrenaline, quite often in this country, you'll certainly find over in the States where they're more conscious of things like that, they will invariably call it epinephrine. Bring me the epinephrine stat. Um, so that's what anaphylaxis is. It's this reaction um, that can be fatal. And uh, most common allergens that cause this reaction are food substances, but uh, it can also be caused by drugs. It can be caused by venom. It can be caused by other things, something as simple as a rubber glove, a latex glove. And somebody who's latex sensitive can cause this reaction. Uh, peanuts, of course, you know, peanut allergy is fatal. And as allergists say, it's not the first peanut that killed you, it's usually the second that the peanut is going to kill you because the first one sensitizes you it puts your body on a heart air trigger alert and then the second time you have this catastrophic uh, reaction by the body's uh, immune system uh, causing all of the things that you can see there uh, and we'll look at in a bit more detail later so an allergen is introduced into the body in some way there is an antibody reaction at the surface of a mast cell in the tissue. And as you know, one of the primary, um, the primary functions of mast cells is to produce histamine and to release the histamine in appropriate circumstances, which of course is what happens when you've got hay fever. Histamine is released into the, uh, into, into the cavities, into your air cavities, and uh, it, it causes myonitis and things like that. And then the mast cell 
releases these chemical mediators, the histamines, which of course is why you take antihistamines to try and stop that uh, in the case of hay fever. And then these chemical mediators, the, the histamines, they act on the organs, the organs of the body, either local organs or, or distant organs as well. So they can act on the lungs, they can act on the heart, they can act on the blood vessels, they can act on the skin. So you can have skin eruptions, you can have the blood vessels enlarging, you can have them becoming more leaky than they normally are, which is why you can see swelling in tissues very often around the face. The face will swell up just like a balloon, as though somebody's pumping it up. And that's where you've actually got vasodilation occurring and you've got the liquid component of the blood, the plasma surrounding the flooding into the tissues. Um, when that happens, of course, that reduces the blood pressure. And if you reduce the blood pressure down and down and down, then the heart has got nothing to pump. It's trying to pump uh, eight, you know, eight pints of blood around some plumbing that is uh, suddenly um, designed to cope with 16 <laughs> pints of blood because everything has expanded. So circulation output uh, becomes highly, highly compromised. And of course, you can get vasoconstriction, vasodilation occurring in the bronchi and the lungs and so on and so forth. So it, um, you know, it is something that has a catastrophic event, effect on the body. And uh, the person here has put, I have suffered with this as I'm allergic to penicillin, not nice. Okay, now that's very interesting. Um, that you, you say it's anaphylaxis uh, to penicillin. And yes, obviously, you know, you can have anaphylaxis as in your case to penicillin. A lot of people that you do ask, you know, before you prescribe them a drug or administer something, and you say, are you allergic to something? And if you were to listen to the population, about 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the population are allergic to penicillin. They're not. I mean, obviously, as the person who has placed that in the box says, I haven't identified you, by the way. I don't know if this is a public box or not. Um, but the person who's put it there has said, I've suffered with anaphylaxis. Uh, so yeah, so obviously you have. But a lot of people who say, oh, I'm allergic to penicillin, they're not. You know, a few years ago, they might have had uh, a case of diarrhea when they, they had some uh, penicillin simply because it killed off some of the good bacteria in their tummy and then they, their digestive system went a bit haywire. Um, but yeah, it can most certainly happen for penicillin. It can happen for any other drugs. And the substances that cause it reaction can be introduced by inhalation. It can be absorbed through the skin. It can be introduced by injection or it can be ingested. You can eat it, as in the case of peanuts, for example. So there's a lot of ways that these allergens can get into the body system. And of course, the sum total of what happens then is this production of histamine from the mast cells. And then all of the things that are described there that histamine does happen. That's when anaphylaxis can kick in. And I've put a list there of more of the effects of histamine on the body, decreased coronary out blood flow, reduced cardiac output, um, Systemic vasodilation, the blood vessels, the peripheral blood vessels especially, so you're in the skin and then the outside of the organs become, uh, become leaky. They can go into bronchospasm. They can get pulmonary vascular vasoconstriction. They can have laryngeal edema where the larynx actually swells up. They can have skin edema where the skin swells up. They can have itching, they can have hives. They can have additional, um, additional reactions to that. There's a whole, whole raft of reactions of signs and symptoms. Once again, I've put a bit here, um, short of breath, wheezing, prolonged sneezing, coughing, tachycardia, uh, you know, where the heart beats very, very rapidly, hypertension. Um, initially, they might feel warm and flushed. Later on, they might feel cold and clammy, edema of the face and neck, uh, severe itching accompanied very often, as I say, by hives and abdominal cramps, so on and so forth. A huge spectrum of reactions can occur if somebody is going into true anaphylaxis. 
fortunately, most of the time, even if it's in a local anaesthetic situation or any other injection situation, like the individual I was talking about last week, um, they simply don't like needles, you know, so they faint. But the trick and the art is to ensure that you do spot the ones that are going into anaphylaxis, uh, because if they're fainting, they'll still be breathing. Um, if they're going into anaphylaxis, it's obvious that there's something dramatically wrong because you'll get all of these other signs and symptoms. They won't just turn white or a slight yellowish color. They will have some of these symptoms developing. And sometimes, of course, they don't develop immediately. They can be delayed. They can sometimes be delayed for a fair time as well. Oh, and they can be sick as well, so they can vomit over you. And in children, anaphylaxis can be even more diverse than it is in adults. So the diagnosis can be quite challenging. Very often, there will be a history of exposure to a known allergen. So very often, people who are a danger of anaphylaxis will already have an EpiPen. They'll already have an, an auto-injector with them, or they should have an auto-injector with them. I lose track of the number of people that I say, do you have adrenaline? Yes, I do. Where is it? Oh, I've left it in the car. Oh, I haven't got it in my bag today, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is where possibly having the stuff yourself can help. But as you can see, in a child, it can be diverse, uh, and it can be difficult to diagnose. But one of the things, of course, you have to consider is if it's an allergen that's present on the skin or um, something that they're in the process of eating, try and remove it. You know, get them to empty their mouth if you have to, uh, or if it's an injection and they're developing anaphylaxis immediately, stop injecting. Um, if it's something that they've been in contact with, maybe you're still using uh, latex gloves. I mean, I, don't, I know not many people in healthcare do use them, but if you are, for example, and they have a reaction to it, then stop touching them with a latex glove. But the classic signs are not always there and they are easily overlooked. But the one thing to be aware of is that true anaphylaxis can occur very, very rapidly and it's not going to be delayed. So that doesn't really make it very easy for you, does it? Because I'm saying two things that are opposing to each other. Yes, it can be very rapid, but then again, it might be delayed. So it's a good idea to make sure for startup that you take a really, really, really good history of your patients. Um, bearing in mind that patients, bless them, sometimes get a little confused and don't tell you everything that they should perhaps be telling you, um, or they forget, or perhaps you don't ask the right questions, nonetheless. Um, because if they do have a rapid anaphylaxis, then they could be very close to dying, and that's where you need to intervene. And there's a well laid out, um, there's a well laid out series of interventions that you can do. If it's obvious that they're going to anaphylaxis, you've got to get medical assistance there as soon as possible. So 999, once again, it's this shouting for help bit or do it yourself if you have to. If you have oxygen present in your location and more and more people do, especially now that you can hire oxygen uh, equipment, uh, on a contractual basis from British Oxygen and people like that, an adequate cylinder that will give you something like 20 minutes supply. So put them on oxygen therapy if you've got them, if they're hypertensive, lie them flat, elevate the legs. And if you are trained, and if you have it, or if they have it, uh, use epinephrine. So as I say, you should already know if they've got epipens. If you routinely use local anaesthetic yourself, then the mere fact that you are able to use local anaesthetic and have a local anaesthetic license means that you do have access to adrenaline. So you can actually purchase adrenaline under your exemption to the Medicines Act that goes with your local anaesthetic license and you should have it present. And that could either be present in the form of an EpiPen, an auto-injector, or it could be present in the form of ampules. Um, Auto-injectors do tend to be quite expensive now. You'll pay 40 or 50 pounds for them minimum. The ampules that you can get are considerably cheaper, but they're more of a fiddle to use. And of course, you have to draw them up. And you've also got the downside that almost invariably, unless you're using a collar around a glass ampule to open it, you'll cut yourself when you're doing it. So there is a possibility of cross-contamination. An EpiPen <coughs> is a very good 
thing to initially use. But then if you do need to administer more adrenaline, it's a good idea to have ampules as a backup. And that's certainly something that I always do. Uh, as I say, people, if they have a history of anaphylaxis, will or should have an EpiPen or a similar type of auto injector. And I will just change my camera over. And you've got a couple there. Now, what you can see here is there is a real adrenaline pen, auto injector, and here is a training one. So when we're training people how to use these, the sequence is quite easy. You grasp the auto injector in the dominant hand. This is if you're giving it to yourself. You remove the safety cap and you plunge the tip of it, which has a needle contained within it. You plunge it to the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh, which is a very, very big muscle because adrenaline for anaphylaxis is certainly in a primary care or a, a, an, an immediate care situation. It is injected intramuscularly. And by plunging this quite firmly against the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh, you'll hear a click. And if this was a real one, that would have developed a needle that's poking out from there to about that depth. And it would be pumping, if it was an, if it was a, an adult EpiPen, it would be pumping a 300 dose 300 micrograms of epinephrine into me. If it was a junior EpiPen, it would be pumping 150 micrograms of epinephrine at a concentration of one in a thousand into me. Um, here's a real one. Get rid of this. As you can see, you've got a safety cap to remove. So you take the safety cap off. If I was to now push that against my hand, which I'm not going to because I haven't got anaphylaxis at the moment, then you would see that a very large needle would come out of there and that would pump 300 micrograms of one in a thousand solution of adrenaline into me and hopefully make me feel a lot better very quickly. So we'll put that to one side there. Now, the point to make, and this is a point that I do try and make um, very decisively, is adrenaline is a prescription only medicine. As I say, if you have a local anaesthetic license or if you're a, an independent prescriber, something like that, then you can most certainly access this yourself. If you're not, then you can use it, but you can't initially access it yourself. But if somebody has an EpiPen and they're unable to administer it to themselves, then you can certainly administer it for them. Because it is one of those strange group of medicines that fall into what we call Schedule 19 of the Medicines Act, or as it used to be Schedule 19 of the Medicines Act, it's slightly changed its uh, location now. But nonetheless, it ceases being a prescription only medicine when it is used with the intent to save life. And there's several other, there's a number of other medicines that actually fall into schedule E19 as, as well. Um, amiodarone, um, glucose and so on and so forth. And the key is, if you understand and are able to administer the medicines and you're not a prescriber and it hasn't been prescribed for you, you can still administer it if you are administering it with the genuine intent to save life. Now, invariably, when I say this on a training course, there'll be somebody sitting usually around the corner and says, no, you can't do that, mate, no, it's impossible. And that's when I put this slide up. So as you can see there, the UK Resuscitation Council say, there is no legal problem in any person administering adrenaline that is either prescribed for a specific person or note this, administering adrenaline to an unknown person 
in such a life-saving situation <clears throat> because there is a specific exemption in the Medicines Act. However, the first aider involved must be competent in being able to recognize the anaphylactic reaction and administer adrenaline using an auto-injector. First aiders, of course, must ensure that they work within the guidelines of the first aid training organization that issued their qualification. Now, as you can see here, I've shown you how to use an auto-injector. It is no more complicated than that. So provided you listen to what I was saying, provided perhaps if you read the book as well, then you would not be breaking the law if you administered adrenaline to somebody who needed it, whether that adrenaline had been um, prescribed for them or you or not, provided it has been um, obtained legally. I mean, if you stole some adrenaline from someone without telling them and then administered it, you wouldn't be within Schedule 19 of the Medicines Act. But if um, Mrs. Smith has got an auto injector and you've got somebody in front of you dying for want of an EpiPen and you administer that, knowing what you're doing, you're not breaking the law. Um, there's also guidance from the Health and Safety Executive, by the way, and this is dating back to 2008. It says the same thing. Just to, uh, just to put your minds at rest. Um, now, this is an interesting point, and it's a point that's worth making. And it's a point that is worth making for those of you who may not have to rely solely on auto injectors, but who might also have the ampule version. And that is the dosage of adrenaline. Now, the UK Resuscitation Council recommends, and most other resuscitation organisations around the world, recommends that the Adult dose of adrenaline or epinephrine, call it what you will, um, should be 500 micrograms, which is 0 0.50 mil, so half a mil. But you might notice if you look on the EpiPens that an adult EpiPen, as you saw there, contains 300 micrograms. So it's a deliberately low dose. Whereas if you are administering from a syringe, then you can most certainly, as a single dose, administer half a mil of the one in a thousand solution. Um, you can administer 250 micrograms um, in the age groups that you can see there, or 120 micrograms or 50 micrograms, although you're highly unlikely to have somebody less than six months that you're going to need to treat. Um, and those dosages can be repeated every five minutes as clinically indicated. Now, obviously, you're going to run out of EpiPens very quickly, apart from the fact that you've given a, a low dose in any event to start it off if you're just relying on the EpiPen. So this is why, certainly if you're doing local anesthesia work, I really do suggest that you have backup ampules, as I also equally suggest you have uh, safety collars fitted around them, which are just like a a plastic tube that fits around it so you can break them open without uh, cutting yourself to ribbons. Um, but be, be aware of those doses uh, and yes, be aware of the fact that you can repeat them. Now, hopefully by the time you've put one or two doses in, if you have to put it in, then you could be in a situation where other help has arrived, in which case you can hand the patient over to, once again, the wonderful paramedics. But you can keep repeating that dosage if you have to um, and worry about the other dosage afterwards but repeating a dose is not a problem it's worth as well uh, mentioning the actual concentration of epinephrine now i was at a trade show a while ago which must remain nameless and i came across and i changed save me changing cameras over let me come back to, to my ugly mug. There we go. Right. Oh, welcome back. Um, I was at a trade show and one of the trade stands was selling those. Which is a preloaded adrenaline syringe. And so, oh, that's good. You know, sell those for uh, anaphylaxis. 
Uh, I gently pointed out to them, or well, maybe not so gently, that this was actually one in 10,000 they were selling. And it does have a place, certainly if you're in a crash team in a hospital, you can use this intravenously in certain situations. But it's certainly not something that would do any good whatsoever injected intramuscularly at all, because it's 10 times too dilute. This is why if you're going into a muscle, you need one in a thousand, not one in 10,000. Um, strangely enough, I haven't seen those traders since. Uh, well, certainly not at any of the uh, any of the trade shows I've been at, because they do really need to understand what they're selling. Um, another thing worth pointing out is that all of the suggestions uh, for the injection site are the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh, uh, which is a nice big juicy muscle. But there are some people that you can't get to the thigh in reality. They might be slumped in such a position you can't find it or some other thing might prevent it or they might just be so fat that if you were to inject it there, all you would end up doing is squirting the adrenaline into the fat instead of the muscle. So then sometimes you do have to consider an alternative site and a good alternative site can be the deltoid muscle in the upper arm, which is something I'm very, very familiar with now, <laughs> having for weeks and weeks and weeks been injecting um, vaccines into it. And that's quite simply is this part here. Now that's quite easy to get to. It can be easier to get to depending on the position of the patient. And also if they're really fat, you'll probably stand a better chance of getting the adrenaline into the muscle there than you will going through a really, really, really thick, heavy set of thighs. Because I remember many years ago when I was actually attending a, a UK resuscitation council, um, advanced life support course, I was talking to an allergist who was um, delivering part of the course and he'd made a study um, of uh, situations where people have been injected with adrenaline but it hasn't worked and he, he claimed that invariably it could be traced back to the fact that they'd got too much subdermal fat so the adrenaline didn't actually reach the muscle so it did nothing. Uh, so you do need to be aware of that uh, when you're going to administer the stuff. So, um, are there any questions, people? Um, and there's a resounding silence. Well, if you do have any questions, then please email head office um, and we will certainly do our best to address them. Uh, we do have a study going on at the moment um, that our medicines committee is looking at uh, under the chairmanship of our redoubtable um, director, uh, Gaynor, Gaynor Wooldridge, who's collaborating with uh, some other colleagues as well. And they are doing a study of situations when there might be um, a an interaction with various medicines because there are a couple of situations where adrenaline can cause a problem. I won't go into the specific medicines today, it's out of the scope of what we're talking about, but that is a piece of research in progress and they're doing meter analysis and the rest on it. So uh, we will hopefully be publishing something, some guidance on that and we will make that guidance obviously available to the, to the entire profession. We don't keep everything to ourselves. A um, couple of questions there. Um, just let me go back a bit. Right, how many shots are usually needed? As many as you need. Um, simple as that. Um, Caroline, oh, you're welcome, Caroline, thank you. Uh, Julie, would you inject through clothing? If I had to, yes. Uh, I mean, certainly if you're, in, if you're injecting atropine, for example, if you're in uh, wearing a nuclear and biological contamination suit, then you actually go through the suit. Not that many of us will be wearing those kind of suits, but an auto injector will go through clothing. Uh, it's best to uh, it's best to you know reveal the patient's skin if you can, but uh, if you have to, yeah, then you have to. Um, what else have we got? Lots of thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I did waffle on a bit, so I'm going to have to be more careful in future because I've overrun my 90 minutes, but. <laughs> You'll know that <laughs> on my weak side. Um, how do I know if I need to repeat the shot? Well, basically, if they continue to die in front of you, then repeat it. Because the worst case scenario is they'll die anyway. But at least if you tried to save them, 
then if there's no resolution at all of the symptoms, then give some more. Um, can you advise on where to purchase the booklet? See Jill about it. Yeah, you can get your booklet. There's actually two booklets. Um, there'll be a booklet which covers all of the slides that I've given you um, that we bind ourselves. And there's also our publication, the AED and BAS one as well. Um, so yeah, Jill can organize that for you and also your CPD certificates as well. Um, right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very, very kind words there. Um, yeah, Kirsty's put there, if you'd like to further your knowledge, obtain the two brochures, take our short assessment, then that will give you a CPD certificate. So it's a short assessment using our class marker system, which is online. Um, okay, and please um, do give some feedback because we're, we're, still, we're still working our way through distance, through online learning. So if you've got any ideas for it, chuck them our way. Um, if you've got any suggestions, then, you know, let us know. And also, if you would like to do one on oxygen, which is a very interesting subject um, that has ramifications that aren't always covered in, in, you know, in enough detail, then if you would like some, some of that, then please tell Jill and the ladies in the office and they'll, they'll sort something out. For you. They'll trot me out the cupboard again and tell them to talk about oxygen. OK, well, on that basis, uh, can I wish you all a very good evening? And thank you for taking the time to come and watch. And uh, we're coming to the other side of this uh, nasty situation we're in, folks. So uh, if, if you're jabbing, then keep on jabbing. Um, and if you haven't had the jab yet, I hope you get it soon. Uh, OK, so I wish you all a good night. Cheerio. <laughs>